Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in our Savior's name to his Father's house of prayer and praise as we continue our celebration of the season of Pentecost, remembering what the words and works of Jesus mean for us as his disciples. The theme that connects all of our lessons and hymns together today is the calling of his disciples, a reminder that while we have not been called to be apostles, through our baptism, each of us has been called to discipleship. We'll follow the order of service that's in your worship folder. Then we do have a note, a reminder that we still are following our social distancing uh, pro protocols. And that means the congregation will only be singing the last hymn. Laude, our group, will be leading us in all the other hymns. May God richly bless your worship today. of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin, and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the innocent life and perfect death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. In the peace of this forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. 
in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness, and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first lesson is the call of Moses into the ministry to help the Lord set his people free. Moses was, of course, a somewhat of an unwilling servant, and so the Lord assures him that he will be with him. As his disciples, we have that same promise today. A lesson according to Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over it and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had got over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. 
This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm for today is Psalm 119. unworthy to be about the call of being Jesus disciples and of course in and of ourselves we are unworthy and yet in our second lesson the Apostle Paul reminds us of the great mercy that was shown him as the pattern of discipleship if Paul has been forgiven then so too have we the second lesson according to first Timothy chapter 1 I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. 
For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Christ. may be seated. We hear our hymn of the day. What do you know about sailing? This is, a probably, this is probably a good time for me to admit to all of you here that I've never actually been sailing myself. So in preparation for this sermon, I had to do a little research, watch a couple movies about sailing. So I watched the modern cinematic masterpiece Moana, and then I watched Titanic. And I think that between those two, I've probably got the gist. So you're out there, and the hot sun is beating down on you. And you can feel the wind blow through your hair. You reach down your hand, and the water feels cool. You can smell that sea breeze. Make way for the king of the world. And then night hits and suddenly everything changes. That hot sun that was keeping you warm a second ago has gone down. And those little waves that were just tapping the side of the boat before are now crashing into your little vessel. The wind is blowing harder and harder and it's taking you and your boat and your sail off course. It's a whole lot scarier now. Added to that, you've been sailing now for the better part of 12 hours. It's somewhere between the hours of 3 or 4 in the morning. And since the water is so rough, it's all hands on deck. So it's not overly surprising to you with this lack of sleep all day that your mind starts playing tricks on you. So you don't pay it much mind when you see that weird light off in the distance. You just figure it's your mind playing tricks on you. So you go down to the side of the boat and you rub your eyes a couple times, shake your head, splash a little bit of that water on your face. 
but curiosity's got the best of you. So you look back to where you saw that light before. Your blood runs cold. You feel goosebumps begin to creep up your skin little by little. And you're frozen and paralyzed with fear. Because that thing off in the distance is still there. The only difference is that now it's a whole lot closer. And it looks a whole lot more like a person. You're frozen there, and you don't know if it comes out of your mouth or the mouth of one of the sailors around you. But either way, you hear it. A ghost! It's a ghost! Chaos. Everyone is running all over the ship, each sailor trying desperately to steer the course away from this thing in the water. All of a sudden, that thing out in the water calls out in a familiar voice. And it says, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. It can't be. It can't be him. You know you left him on the shore 12 hours ago. But you would bet for anything that that's the voice of your teacher, the voice of your master, the voice of Jesus. But you left him, and while you're still thinking through all of this, a man who's not necessarily known for thinking everything through, your bold, brash brother in the faith, Peter, calls out to this Jesus on the water and says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. All eyes are on Jesus, who answers with one word. He says, come. All eyes are now back on Peter, who doubles down on his test of Jesus and jumps out of the side of the boat. And you've seen Peter do this hundreds of times before, where he jumps down out of the side of the boat to fix the nets or bring the ship back into shore, all sorts of different things like that. You watch him plunge into the clear blue water beneath. But that's not what happens this time. As you wait for him to plunge into that water, instead, Peter's knees buckle. And you see it with your own eyes. Peter is standing on the surface of the water. He has his eyes deadlocked on Jesus, and he's walking him. You've got to be dreaming. You've got to be dreaming. You must have fallen asleep on your watch. This can't be happening. But no amount of pinching yourself is getting you out of this one. Peter is walking through the waves. Peter is walking against the wind. And he's almost to him. He's almost to Jesus. And all of a sudden, you see it. Peter's head turns. It's slight, but it's enough. Peter is no longer walking on water. Peter has begun to sink. He lost his focus on Jesus. And to all of us from the outside looking in, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because Peter knows full well that Jesus changed water into wine. Peter has seen Jesus make the blind see and the lame and the crippled walk. Less than a day ago, somewhere around 12 hours ago, Peter watched Jesus take five loaves of bread and two fish and feed a crowd until they were over full of 5,000 more people. Peter held in his own two hands a basket of more food than they had started with. One of 12 baskets. And now, Jesus is denying the laws of physics. He's bending the laws of nature so Peter can walk on water. And he's afraid 
of a couple waves a few feet high. It's classic Peter, isn't it? Pillar of faith or a pillar of doubt. Come on, Peter. It's a little embarrassing, isn't it? Keep your eyes on Jesus, Peter. Do we keep our eyes on Jesus? When the waves and the wind of our lives crash against our little boats, do we keep our eyes deadlocked on our Savior? Sometimes. Sometimes, even though the whole world seems to be crashing down around us, we hold to the promises of our Savior. Christ be my leader, we say and we sing, and we know that God has us in his hands. But what happens when the storm gets worse? When the wind and the waves of our lives here on earth crash and beat down against us? What happens when we've been saving up for months, for years, to finally buy a new car for us and our families? Just to get T-boned on the way out of the dealership. What happens when our medical bills are so expensive that we can't afford to take our children to see a doctor? What happens when the prejudice and the bigotry and the civil unrest that we thought lived and stayed beneath the Mason-Dixon line creeps up into our areas and our neighborhoods? Then what? Do we fall to our knees in prayer before our mighty God and ask him to help us? Sometimes. Sometimes we shoot up a couple quick prayers, and after waiting for a couple days, which seems like an eternity with no response, we give up on God. Or maybe we don't go to God in prayer at all. Maybe we try to take our own problems and our own sins on our own shoulders. Maybe we self-medicate. We try to eat away our problems, to drink away our sins? Do we get violent physically or emotionally with the people we love the most? With the people who love us the most? Then we're not walking on water anymore. We're sinking. We've lost our focus on Jesus. Peter lost his focus on Jesus. And he sank. And he should have kept sinking to the bottom of the sea in that storm. And he should have kept sinking and sinking and sinking into the depths of hell. An imperfect man in the hands of a perfect God. But that's not how the story ends, is it? Peter has just doubted his Lord and Savior, and he's sinking. And the first thing that comes to his mind is clear as he calls out, Lord, save me. And then what does Jesus do? Does he fold his arms and look down into the water and let Peter just, just flounder around for a little bit to show just how hurt he is, that he would not trust his mighty God? Of course not. We're told in our text for today that Jesus immediately reaches down his arm to pull Peter out of the water. He says to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's stern, but it's gentle. And the two come back to the boat. And all at once, the wind dies down and the waves subside and the chorus rings out from the people on the ship surely you are the son of god peter lost his focus on jesus and he sank but immediately jesus reached down his strong but gentle arms to pull him out of the water 
It doesn't take much piecing together to find out how God treats us a lot like Peter. We fall. We start to sink every day of our lives. But we cry out, Lord, save me. And the Lord reaches down his strong and gentle arms to pull us out of our sin. There is no sin heinous enough. There is no depression deep enough. There is no life of mistrust that is long enough or horrible enough to keep Jesus from reaching down those arms and pulling us out of our sin. Peter was saved by those strong arms of Jesus. And a year after Peter was saved, Jesus took those same strong but gentle arms and did something even more amazing. He spread them for us on the cross. Those hands that reached down to scoop his doubting disciple out of the water were pierced by nails driven through. He hung there for Peter's doubt. He bled there for your self-reliance. He died there for me, for you. And those same pierced hands that hung on the cross, a few days later, Jesus shows to his disciples to prove he's risen, that he rose for Peter and those disciples, that he rose for me, that he conquered death, sin, and the devil for you. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your focus on your Savior. And even when you fall and when you fail and when you begin to sink, call out to your Lord. Lord, save me. And he will pull you up. Amen. Now may the peace of God which transcends all understanding guard and keep your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We'll now read the sermon text from Matthew chapter 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The word of the Lord. We'll continue with the confession of faith found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll now hear the musical offering.
on page 10 with the prayer of the church. We pray. Father, for giving us life and breath, talent and energy, we thank you. For income and nourishment, for honest work and opportunities to be useful, we look gratefully to you as our provider. For safety in our travels, we rejoice in the protection your angels give. For national peace, public prosperity, and moral consciousness in all citizens, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, through you we have the full rights of children of God. What love the Father has lavished on us through our relationship with you. We praise you for saving us and giving your life as a ransom for our sin. May our spirits revive in the rest and peace of your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, through word and sacrament, restore to us the joy of your salvation. Cause the good seed of the word to produce sturdy faith and godly attitudes and behavior in each believer. We rejoice this day in the fellowship we enjoy in our congregation and our synod. Keep our parish and synodical leaders faithful to their tasks. Make them men of both courage and prayer. Preserve Christ-centered doctrine and practice in our fellowship at all times. Make each of us active in Christian service and supportive of our leaders. O God, the giver of life, health, safety, and strength, we praise you for having granted your servant Mel Schuler a successful heart procedure. May he daily remember your great goodness, that he may serve you with a life that reflects genuine thankfulness for all your blessings. Lord God, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believer, Betty Freilich, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought her to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus, our risen and ever-living Lord. This weekend, our nation sets aside time to celebrate Father's Day. Therefore, we ask that you bless all earthly fathers as they seek to fulfill the calling you have entrusted to them. Give them loving hearts and sound judgment to exercise godly family leadership. May they daily take to heart your admonition not to discourage or embitter their children by treating them harshly or unfairly. Help them instead to bring up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. In loving Christian fathers, may children see reflections of you, the Father whose love for us is perfect and complete. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Open our eyes to see the spiritual dangers facing those who do not yet trust you as Savior and Lord. Move us to share with them the hope of unending life we have in you. Go with us into our world and support us in all we do to your glory. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We join together to sing our closing hymn, O Christ who called the twelve.
Good morning again to all of you. It's been a pleasure to worship with you today. Also to be with those of you who are watching us on live, on, on live on our Facebook page. It's a privilege to have worshiped with you this morning as well. Just a few announcements to share with you. A reminder that our new pastor, Pastor Kester, will be installed on July 19th at 2 p.m. at the Menominee Falls campus. We'd ask that you put that on your calendar and join us for that special celebration. Uh, we'd also like to announce, you may have experienced this yourself, that we are having significant problems with our phone system here at Bethlehem. Uh, people are calling in, getting two rings, and then immediately being disconnected. And so we're asking if you uh, need any kind of pastoral care, that instead of trying to call the church, you would call me directly. My cell phone is printed on the back page of the bulletin, and you're more than welcome to call at any time. I look forward to greeting you at the door, and may God richly bless you in a new week of grace. Thank you. 